said before, I'm Tara, I'm the host for the webinar today. I'm a member of the Zoom team at the Foundation for Inner Peace. And we are holding these Let's Discuss Zoom webinars as an expression of our goal of extending love through the teachings of A Course in Miracles more widely. Our speaker today is Judy Scutch Whitson, chairperson of the board of directors and founder of the Foundation for Inner Peace. So this webinar has a large turnout and we're grateful for all of your participation. I know we're going to have even more people joining this webinar. And the format today is that after Judy speaks, we will have time for people to type questions into the webinar uh, Q&A panel and we will answer as many as time allows. But please understand we will not be able to get to everyone's questions, but your questions are important to us and we are working to find the best way to respond to them. So please feel free to write into the Q&A panel of today's webinar. Now, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce Judy. But before I do that, I want to just read as an opening prayer, one very short quote from the Course. All miracles mean life, and God is the giver of life. His voice will direct you very specifically. You will be told all you need to know. Judy. Welcome, everyone, to my garden. It really is my garden, by the way. So I feel as if you're all here with me in my house in California and I am delighted to have you. I don't know if I can serve you tea and cookies, <laughs> but I wish I could. What I wanted to tell you to begin with is that number one, I'm 88 years old and my voice isn't as strong as it used to be. So we're gonna do something a little bit different today. I am here physically and will be with you, but for the first 30 minutes, we're going to listen and watch what I learned from the scribes. I will continue afterwards, but at least I'll know you get 30 minutes without my voice failing. So thank you for your patience. And I do hope that this tells you a little bit about what it was like in the very early days of A Course in Miracles to be with, work with, live with Dr. Helen Shuckman and Dr. William Thetford, co-scribes of A Course in Miracles. And here's the video. So my purpose today is to tell you of my own personal experiences with the scribes, Helen and Bill. And I hope I can bring them even more alive for those of you who are interested. I do want to recount the ways in which these two professors of psychology became my teachers for the rest of their lives. Where to pick up the many memories that crowd my mind as I try to select a few choice stories that illustrate the depth of the level these two people knew and understood the course and how they taught it to me. One night, I had a deeply disturbing dream. It was sharp and memorable, and I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. During the next afternoon with Helen, I told her the dream, and this is what it was. I dreamt I was not a body, but a tiny speck of consciousness drifting in a vast sea of forever. There was nothing to see, no place to go, just awareness of being. And it was quite peaceful. All of a sudden, I felt a magnetic pull tugging at me, and I was chagrined to notice that in the far distance I could perceive something big, black, ugly, and threatening. I tried to change direction, but could not. I was on a straight track towards the object and helpless to break the pull. As I came closer, I realized it was, don't laugh now, a big, 
ebony salad bowl. Well, of course, it doesn't sound frightening now, but this was in the middle of the night, and it was a dream. I was still trembling at the thought as I recounted this dream to Helen. Suddenly, I perceived myself suspended above it, and I didn't know what to do. I kept my figurative eyes as a speck of consciousness closed and was just shaking. Finally, I felt impelled to open my eyes and look down into that ugly, horrendous, ebony salad bowl, but it wasn't black at all. It was glistening clear acrylic purple with beautiful rays of light emanating from it. I stared in wonder and the fear subsided. Obviously, I couldn't shake this dream nor explain it to myself. When I finished telling the story quite out of breath, she smiled and she took my hand and she patted it as if I were a tiny child. Oh, kitten, she exclaimed, don't you see? The dark, bottomless, ebony, black bowl was your guilt. You faced it and you recognized it was nothing. A dream in the abstract, a gentle nudge from my teacher to interpret changing one's mind about threat, about fear. What a lesson in forgiveness that was. A shift in perception. Reperceiving fear and watching it turn into love. It was a miracle, and miracles are natural signs of forgiveness. On a lighter note, Bill always kept us supplied with humor and antics to amaze us. Bill had developed a selective listening to resolve what seemed like insurmountable problems. He loved opera, particularly anything by Mozart and Wagner's The Ring Trilogy. Bill would never get tickets in advance. He'd decide on the same day that he was in the mood to attend. However, Bill had favorite seats. They had to be in the orchestra, preferably fourth or fifth or sixth rows, but on the aisle. His long legs and his great consumption of coffee made it imperative for him to have as quick an exit as possible. So he would announce to us, Tonight, I'll go to hear the magic flute. Do you have tickets, one would ask? Oh, no, but I will. I'll go tonight at, um, 7.30. Then he'd take himself to the Metropolitan Box Office right after it opened and wait until his selective listening told him, Now! And he'd go up to the box office and request two on the aisle, preferably between the fourth and the sixth row. Sure enough, some subscriber had turned in a pair as they couldn't be used that night. And Bill would smile, and it was opera time. The closest he ever came to not getting return tickets was the time I was with him. I was a bit skeptical, I must admit. Not about this working, but about it working every time. So I went with him at the designated time, and I stood on line with him while he requested seats for that evening's performance. Nope. None available. Too bad. No one had turned a seat in. I felt devastated for him. Not Bill. He cocked his head to one side as if re-listening and did not move from his place. And there was a line waiting behind him. When the ticket seller narrowed his eyes at Bill, nudging in a loud voice, Next! Bill still didn't move. Even as the annoyed attendant was beginning to say something like, Really, sir, you must move away. The telephone rang right by his elbow. The box office person answered it, and with a look of incredulity, he hung up and he turned to Bill. He fished around in his desk and he pulled out a pass. You're lucky, buddy, he said. One of our regulars called and said his plane had just landed. He wouldn't be able to get here in time. You can have his tickets. Bill smiled gratefully and with a little wink at me, said... Well, now, that was Bill's equivalent of gotcha. Miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. Bill lived by that. (laughs) He expected it all the time. He knew that he had to be in the right state of mind, though, or nothing would happen. And, of course, a miracle being a shift in perception, (laughs) he had to let go of his fear about not getting that which he wanted. One very cold, wintry Easter day in April, New York, Bill had promised to take an elderly woman to Easter dinner at someone's house, and he was going to be her escort, and he did it every year. 
Only this year, who would expect a blizzard in April? And the bill didn't drive, he didn't have a car, there was absolutely no way for him to get a taxi, and he didn't know what to do. So he did what you do in a situation like that. He sat down and he asked. And he heard the advice to get up, get dressed, wait on the street corner on Park Avenue and 71st Street. Now. And so he did that. He stood on the street corner of Park Avenue and 71st Street in a blizzard. Very few cars were out anyway. And those that were out were driving very slow and taking people someplace. And he wondered whether he was a little bit nuts at this point, when all of a sudden, a huge stretch limousine stopped right near him, pulled down the window and said, uh, hey, you need to go someplace? And Bill said, I beg your pardon. He said, well, I just dropped my people off and I have some spare time and you look like you're never going to get a ride. And so Bill opened the door and he thanked them and they went to the old lady's house and he went up into her apartment and he brought her down and she looked at the limo and said, Oh my, my, Bill, you didn't have to go to such trouble for me. And Bill laughed and they drove to the place where the dinner was going to be held and uh, Bill took the lady out of the car and then he went back to ask the limo driver, How much do I owe you? And the man looked at him and said, You don't owe me anything, buddy. It's Easter. And by the way, when are you going to leave? Maybe I can give you a lift back. Miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. And, even more so, miracles arise from a miraculous state of mind or a state of miracle readiness. Bill demonstrated that so completely, it was a lesson so thoroughly learned by me and all of those who knew him, that it's almost like breathing now when this happens. And isn't that right? Of course. Bill taught in other ways, too. He didn't raise his voice. He wasn't demanding. He didn't have high expectations of me. He returned my love equally and coolly. One day, I wasn't in New York City where I lived at the time. I was in California visiting a very good friend. And we got into this terrible argument, which really meant that I screamed at him and he cried. And I yelled at him and I cussed him out. I don't even remember what he did, but whatever it was, I thought it was terrible. And he finally hid inside his room and he locked the door and I knew that I couldn't get at him to kill him, which of course is what I wanted to do. So I went to the telephone and I called Bill Thetford back in New York City and I was crying on the phone and I said and he did this and he did that and then he did this and that and now he's in his room and I can't even get him there to kill him. It's quiet. And Bill said, there are only eight little words I have to say to you. Are you willing to see your brother sinless? No, I screamed. Well then, Judy, when you are, you'll feel just fine. And he hung up. You can imagine how stunned I was, and also angry, but I did it. Later, Bill reminded me of something we all know really well, and I'm sure have said many, many times. My sinless brother is my guide to peace. My sinful brother is my guide to pain, and which I choose to see, I will behold. Lesson learned for then. After I had heard this story, which had been kept secret for so long, with only a few people being cognizant of this amazing spiritual document, I asked Helen if she was aware of the source of the voice she claimed dictated the entire course to her. For me, this was an obvious question, because during my years of reading and research and teaching, I had come into contact with more than a few channels and mediums. They were old hat for me. And many of them had identified the sources of inspiration, such as Emmanuel and Seth and Eileen Garrett, the famous medium, had her gatekeeper. I was thus very surprised to see Helen get quite pale again and lower her eyes and look away from me. Bill laughed and grabbed her hand again and said, Come on, Helen, if we're going to show her our document, she'll figure it out in no time. Reluctantly, Helen hissed out of the side of her mouth. 
He says he's Jesus. Well, is he? I urged. Her reluctance vanished, and she smiled so sweetly, looked at me and said, Of course it is. That's when I found out that both Helen and Bill were very embarrassed to be telling this story to a stranger, and especially to reveal the source. I guess I was so much less new to this than they were, and probably so much more accepting, since I didn't find anything strange at all about this story. In fact, it felt as if it were the most natural thing in the world, to be sitting there with them and hearing something that sounded so wondrous and yet so reasonable. I did ask, of course, right away to see the material, and they unlocked the filing cabinet hidden in their office, and brought out seven large black thesis binders stuffed with pages. They were professors and they supervised many people uh, who were getting their PhDs and so these were the kind of binders that were very common for them to use. Bill put the first one on my lap and I opened it up to the introduction that you all know so well. I can't say I understood it, but I intuited that this was the help I had been seeking, in fact the help I had unknowingly begged for just a few weeks earlier when I cried out, won't someone up there please help me? I asked to take the books home and they agreed, as long as I would not show them to anyone. Of course I concurred. One thing I wanted to know though, and this was a puzzlement, why me? Bill explained that when they were finished with the scribing and the recopying and the editing of the course, they felt it was not for them alone. Helen asked the voice whether this sense was true, and she was told, yes, someone will come to take it on its way. Still wondering and waiting a few months later, she asked again, and this time was told, the woman who was coming is not yet ready. And finally, when Bill felt he had intuitively identified that woman as me, Helen asked the voice again, why her? And she was told that I was finally ready for my spiritual education. When they told me this, I knew it was the only answer I could accept, because it was absolutely true. Helen affirmed this with the reminder that no one is sent by accident to anyone. And Bill chimed in with, no one is where he is by accident. And chance plays no part in God's plan. I believed this and I had the feeling that I would probably read this in the document I was now taking home. And eventually I did. But that first day with these three people, Helen, Bill and Ken, my awareness began of something unfolding of which I was but a part, and over which I had no control. Weeks later, when I mentioned to Bill how weird it was that I had blurted out to Helen at the table that day in the faculty dining room, so you are hearing an inner voice, he laughed and said, that's when he was sure I was the one. And then he quoted me a line from the course, which affirmed the rightness of my outburst to Helen. You have succeeded whenever you have reached another mind and joined with it. Just what I thought, I said. So that was my new beginning, my change in life, and everything from then on became for me either before the course or after the course. As naturally as water flowing, we began to meet daily and talk about the course as I studied it. Remember, they'd had it for many years, and Ken was already there two and a half years before me, so he had thoroughly studied it. He had also been responsible in getting Helen, who was kicking and screaming, to re-edit the material to decide upon capitalization and paragraphing and chapter headings. And of course, the way he did that was they would ask together every single thing they knew had to be done. They would ask for the Holy Spirit to guide them and give them an answer. So by the time I got there, it was already in publishable shape. I nicknamed them, without telling them in the beginning, the Holy Three. And that was because this trio seemed that way to me. 
We had daily gatherings at my house, and I was able to keep focused as I studied a truly remarkable document because of their help. They did rush me along a bit. I had to spend a lot of time reading and digesting. But how lucky I was to be able to ask questions of the duo who scribed the material. No one could know it better than Helen and Bill. Their subjective attitudes about this term time working with me in my home differed. Helen was truculent in the beginning of a discussion. She would fuss, she would fidget, and think of all sorts of other more interesting things we could be doing at the moment. Bill was attentive, ready for coarse conversation, but he was punning all the while. Ken had the enormous task of keeping Helen going and serving her so well that he would know when she had enough. Then he would take her home to her dinner and her husband. There were many times we spent on a one-to-one -one basis. Helen would play the role with me of mother and teacher. She loved me to call her mama, and she called me kitten. We shopped and we gossiped. We went through my wardrobe. She threw out all the clothes she didn't like. She made me go to the shoe store and get shoes just like her, which were sensible flats, but ugly as can be. She was a study in opposites. Helen was nourishing and loving to me, yet sometimes very critical and extremely demanding. I soon learned this was a very complex, intelligent, and intense lady. And what a therapist she was. Many times I witnessed how she dealt with people who had problems. They could have been people she knew. They could have been patients I heard about. They could have been people who were coming to my house to visit with them. She always was so right on. She was intuitive and insightful and clear and quite remarkable indeed. But then there was this other side, and I felt both protective of her and defensive from her. Bill, on the other hand, would often eat dinner with us and just play at words, at jokes, at relaxing. There were many differences of opinions and quite vocal between the two of them. It was clear to see that these two were not a matched pair. Yet despite past and current animosities, some recriminations, old, painful history rehashed, and the opposite of forgiveness, the very great lesson I learned from spending years and years with Helen and Bill together was when it came time to explain the course, to meditate together asking for guidance for its future. Then they were of one mind. They would reach out for each other, hold hands, and pray. And what emerged was a peacefulness, a gentleness, a purposefulness about their relationship that was stunningly beautiful to see. I wondered how to express this change to myself and others. When I finally read the sentence in the Course in the next to last chapter, the will of God forever lies in those whose hands are joined. The will of God forever lies in those whose hands are joined. I knew this was what I had witnessed so many times with my beloved teachers. Helen was a bit of a hypochondriac. She knew all the things that could go wrong with the body and she feared them. She examined each new symptom, be it a cold or stomach ache, as if it could be something much worse. Bill composed a mantra. Its rhythm and substance will be quite familiar to you long-term students of the course. Whenever Helen would worry out loud about coming down with something, Bill would chant, I am a body, I am sickly, get me to a doctor quickly, over and over again, and finally Helen would just have to laugh. Sometimes Bill would tease Helen, misquoting some of the lyrics that they both admired. The operettas of Gilbert and Sullivan was a favorite of them both. One day, Helen was complaining about the voice, which as usual was giving her really good guidance that she didn't like. Bill stood up, he did a little soft shoe routine, and he announced that he had the new theme song for the popular Broadway show, Call Me Madam. He wanted to abbreviate the name of the show, though, from Call Me Madam to Call Me Mad. And the opening song starred that he said as a duet. But he performed both his parts and Helen's, because there was no way she would get involved with it. 
And it went something like this. I'm going to attempt something I have never done. Uh, when I was in school and the children used to sing, I was told, I was a sparrow, please shut up. So I'm now going to sing to you. This is a little beginning of a play, a musical play that Bill wrote for him and Helen. Helen comes on stage. She's very distraught. She's in her office. There are the typewriters they use to type down the course, and there are all the accoutrement, the cups of coffee that they had constantly all day. And she stands and she looks at the audience and she sings. I hear voices and there's no one there. I hear voices, but the room is bare. And then comes the counterpoint. So Bill would break into the song, and he sang the counterpoint, and it went, You sure need analyzing. It is not so surprising that you feel very mad and still. Your heart goes pitter-patter. I know just what's the matter. This voice stuff is a bitter pill. We would crack up in laughter, and we never, ever heard any more of it if there was any, because he would just make us laugh so hard. It became a running joke. Every time things got uptight, Bill would introduce a new imaginary character to this imaginary musical. But we didn't hear any more songs. He would just continue with the casting, who would play this part and who would play that part. He was funny. Often when I read the line in the chorus, and God's son forgot to laugh, I'd remember Bill making light of even the angst around learning the course. And once again, remember to laugh at our illusion. At one point in our relationship, we decided that it might be a good idea for us all to live together. I mean, can you believe that? That would be Helen and her husband, Louie, by the way, he wanted no part of this, Bill, Ken, my husband, Bob Scutch, and myself. So, of course, being a little nester, I started searching for the perfect place. Uh, Helen said it had to have water near it, it should be on a hill, it should be this, it should be that. Well, you can imagine what a wild goose chase I went on, and of course I never found it. And then it turned out that no one really wanted to do that anyway. They were trying to um, make me feel good. I was complaining. What kind of a lesson is this anyway? I spend all this time looking at properties, I go running hither and yon, and no one even wants to do this. What a waste. Grouse, grouse, grouse. Bill was reading the paper and half listening to me. And then he waited until I finished complaining. Dear, he intoned with a poker face, don't you know that heaven is your real estate? I threw a pillow at him. At one time, I was going through the end of a very nasty special relationship, and I mean nasty. Finally coming out of it on the peaceful side with much help from my therapist, Helen, I said to her, well, now I understand what that was all about. I had to learn how ugly specialists can get when one wants to try to control another person and make them be what you want them to be, when you want something from them and they don't give back. Oh, why would you need to learn that, kitten, Helen purred? Well, so I could empathize with other people who also have this experience, and since I'm going around and presenting the course, I need to know a little bit about the special relationship stuff as if I didn't have others. I said this quite smugly. Out came the claws. Nonsense, she retorted. Don't be ridiculous. The Holy Spirit teaches that sacrifice in any form is unnecessary. Was I ever quiet? Bill was often consulted by friends who asked him, how do I know if I'm making progress in this course? He always had the same gentle answer. It depends upon how long you now hold a grievance. And you know, I still do that today, years and years since he's died, and I still think about how is my relationship with so-and-so, am I still holding on to any grievance? If I can answer really, no, I say thank you, Bill. It's a great yardstick. Toward the end of Helen's life, she did become seriously ill, and she worried about money. How could she afford the doctors and the nurses and the medicines? To try to ease her mind, I volunteered, Helen, I know you are not destitute, but if you really feel you don't have enough, I'm going to go to the bank, withdraw all my assets, and sign them over to you. Oh, kitten, she murmured. That wouldn't be enough. Okay, then, I'll ask Bob and Bill and Ken to do the same. She thought about this for a second. And then the Helen Clear voice came forth. 
kitten, there is no amount of money in this whole wide world that would make me feel safe. This remark has stayed with me throughout the years and has served as a powerful reminder when I get trapped in some wrong-mindedness. With Helen, the powerful teaching was usually do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> and for me, it worked. One day, when discussing the application of forgiveness, Bill came up with a catchy phrase that has served us so very well. He said, the concept of forgiveness is easy when you think of it as celestial amnesia, forgetting everything negative about someone and remembering only the positive, remembering only love. I love that. It's something I still think of today. Obviously, I could go on for days, but how do you summarize 30 years of learning? And what is the point of reminiscing anyway? If there is anything at all that you take away from this time we spent together, it's the very ordinariness of the scribes of the Course. They were two ordinary people to whom something extraordinary happened because they joined in looking for a better way. Myths about them abound, and they are mostly just that, myths. The last thing in the world these two private folk would want is for their personas to be distorted and exalted. They would often claim, sometimes with disgust, we are not gurus of this course, we are only its first students. Our Bill was a pragmatic professor who claimed he had nothing to profess. Our Helen was a woman who had learned how to get out of the way and listen. Together, they both perfectly performed their function, and for that, we are eternally grateful. I know I am, and I have a feeling that you are too. God bless them, and love is the way we walk in gratitude. Judy, we'd love to hear just a closing summary, and I need your help, please, if you could turn on your video. Does that work? <laughs> We're close, but not quite. I'm so sorry for that slight technical hiccup. Hold on one second. It says that you stopped it, honey. I know. You participant count active speaker view. Allow participants. Okay. I think it should work now. Just ask you to start my video. Start my video. Perfect. You did it. Wonderful. <laughs> well, as we can all see, I hope everyone can hear me and come back to my garden. As we can all see from the filmlet that I made quite a while ago but was never shown. I think you know the time has passed. And this is 14 years after that filmlet was put together. Who knew why, just in case for a moment like this. It's been 44 years for me since I was handed the manuscript of A Course in, Bill, a Course in Miracles by Bill and Helen. 
And of course, time doesn't stand still in this illusion that we've made, but it also can be shortened a lot at the level of spirit. And one of the things that the course is for is to help shorten time. And I thought before we have questions and hopefully some answers, that there was something that was missing from this that was very powerful for me and that I never remembered to include at the time that this film was made. And I'll set the situation for you. I lived in New York City, as did Helen and Bill and Ken, and in a very large apartment, which we used for greeting people from all over who started to be interested in the course and wanted to know more about it from the scribes themselves. And one day, after a very long session with about 20 or 30 people who were interested and wanted to find out how the course could be applied for them, most everyone had cleared out. There were four men left and Bill Thetford. The four men were all doctors, all from a particular university in a teaching sense, and also they practiced medicine. And I was making dinner, <laughs> and I had a very large pot of boiling oil on because I was making French fries the right way. And I was a little bit annoyed that I was in the kitchen. I really wanted to be with the people discussing this, but here I was in the kitchen making their dinner. So I was miffed. And in a little bit of a, more than a little bit annoyed state of mind, I moved the pot quickly and spilt it all over my left hand from mid arm all the way down to my fingertips, boiling hot oil. Well, you can remind, I mean, you can imagine the screams that I emitted, enough to make the five men come running into my kitchen to see what was the matter. And four of them who were doctors immediately started to get into action. One went to the telephone to call the ambulance, another one to call the hospital and say we were coming. One was standing by me for a few minutes watching the blisters form, saying, oh my goodness, this is either a second or a third degree burn. And I was in such shock, I couldn't scream anymore. And they cleared out looking for things to do to assist me immediately. And Bill just looked into my eyes and he said, are you ready? I didn't know what he meant, but I looked into his eyes and I said, yes. And he took his two hands, one under my hand and the other over my hand without touching it. And he closed his eyes. So I closed my eyes too. And I was so intrigued with this tableau <laughs> that I forgot that I was in pain. And I opened my eyes a few minutes later and I wasn't in pain. The burn was totally gone. There wasn't one remnant of it. And Bill looked at it and he just smiled and patted me on the shoulder. Well, the men came running back because everything was set to take me to the, into the ambulance to the hospital and doctors are waiting on the other side to take care of my arm. And they took one look at the hand and they of course could not believe their eyes. They had witnessed something that their mind could not take in. And so they left. <laughs> what else was there to do? They left. But I have never forgotten the peace that I felt in the trust that I gave Bill as I closed my eyes and gave him my wounded hand. And there is something to say about that that I would like to read you because my memory isn't so hot anymore either. <laughs> and I'm going to read if you excuse me a second, because this is something that that incident taught me so completely. The miracle substitutes for learning that might have taken thousands of years. It does so by the underlying recognition of perfect equality of the giver and the receiver. It is that on which the miracle rests. The perfect equality of giver and receiver. The miracle substitutes for thousands of years. Those of you who have been studying the course for what seems like thousands of years have a good idea of what that means. And while the course is called one of many, many ways to remember who we are and to awaken in God's presence, but it is the way that is called the shortest up the mountain. Instead of going around in circles and going up gradually, it's straight up the side 
And that's why it seems so difficult to so many people. And that's why it isn't for everyone. I do think that we all have these wonderful lessons in our lives. We don't need to learn them from the scribes. But that was my path then, and that's what happened to me. And I am delighted to share it with you and to remind myself how natural it is to have miracles in our lives daily. But we must be miracle ready. Now, if there are questions, I'm glad to attempt an answer. Wonderful, Judy. Thank you so much for bringing the video to the present. Uh, we have our first question that I'd like to start with is from Sonia in Colombia. She wrote, I have the impression that Helen Shuckman said that the course is true, but she didn't believe it. I found that very strange. Is it true? Absolutely, I was there. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. I can tell you absolutely I was there. Uh, actually, Willis Harmon, who was a professor at uh, Stanford University, was visiting us in New York because he wanted to meet Helen. And they talked for hours about statistics, which was a subject that she was pretty well informed about, and he was too. And so they found commonality. And all of a sudden, Willis looked at his watch and he said, oh, I've got to go to the plane and I haven't even talked to you about what I came for. And she said, oh, well, don't bother about that. He said, no, no, but before I leave, Helen, would you tell me really, what do you think about the course? And she thought for a second and then she looked directly at him and she said, you know, Willis, I know it's true. I just don't believe it. And when he left, I had the courage to say to her, Helen, what you said to Willis wasn't quite accurate. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, there's only one letter that has to be changed. You said, you know it's true. You just don't believe it. The D and the don't must be a W. So you know it's true and you just won't believe it. I was commenting upon volition, willingness, and Helen did not have the volition or the willingness to practice the course. It was her choice. And I also think it was perfect that way because did she know it? Oh, very well. Did she choose to use it? No, she did not want to give up her prejudices, her angers and her fears. She did not want to. And that was her choice. And don't we all know so many people like that, even people studying the course, they don't really want to give up the past. They don't want to really let go. They don't really want to give up anything in order to accept God's plan of atonement. And that's okay. There'll be other ways and other times for them. They'll find something that's right for them. But Helen chose not to, and it was her right. Thank you, Judy. Our next question is this. I am a long-term student of the course. I get concerned that I can, it can evoke a head in the sand mentality to the violence of our relationship to each other and the environment. Is this something Bill, Helen, or Ken ever engaged with? I remember reading somewhere from Ken that he felt that kindness towards the world was required, including to all of life. Well, kindness, as you know from many teachers and avatars, and some even living today, is a very important part of the spiritual path. So as we see ourselves living in this dream, this world of illusion, that seems very real to us indeed, practicing kindness is necessary. And it would be practicing kindness even to the situations, not only to the people. How do you practice kindness to an environmental concern such as the burning of the Amazon forests. That's a very big one. The only way I could answer this for myself is I recognize it. I recognize what the problem is. It's really a problem of separation. And I go within and I ask, how should I think about this? If I don't do this a hundred times a day, I'm not really living the life that I want to choose. 
people will get different answers depending upon what their lessons are because the internal teacher, the Holy Spirit, knows better than we do. So that some people will have to take an active part in demonstrations. Some people will have to take an active part in fundraising to try to help the situation by allowing other people who know how to visit the area and perhaps do things like planting trees again or influencing the governments of that country. There are people all over who get guidance to do things that we wouldn't do ourselves because we don't need to. What we need to do is turn over the whole situation, the horror of the dream, to the Holy Spirit and say, how should I think about this? What shall I do? I know many people talk about the Course is an ostrich in the sand, hiding its head, because there is very definitely a section that I need do nothing. Well, if people would read on <laughs> and really try to remember what it says, it also tells us we need do nothing except go to the still, small, quiet center within, from which we will be sent forth on all the busy doings of the world. I hope that helps. Thank you, Judy. From Jay, we have another question. Bill was able to get very specific help in the world, such as getting the opera tickets. Do you think this can be a trap to look for something specific in the world? Do I feel so? Absolutely not. But remember, we all have differences of opinion, even students of the course. Uh, no, I found it with Bill, and since he was a great teacher of mine with myself, that there is no trap except the traps we make with our own mind. If our minds and hearts are open, and again, we ask for the guidance of everything, then we are going to get exactly what we need at that time, at that moment, that will help us along our way. We didn't undertake this path lightly. Remember, we have a partner. We're not going it alone. The partner within is the true guide and the true teacher of the Course. Okay. We have a question from Monica. Do you feel you understand the Course completely now? Do you have <laughs> any outstanding things that you still need to master? Does this Course lead to enlightenment? <laughs> um, after 44 years, I can tell you that I am not a person who can, who can actually chant chapter and verse. But I think that my way is I've been guided to understand the course after reading it, many men, never not reading it or doing the lessons, is by applying it. It's the application of the course that really it's all about. Studying the text and learning it very well is an excellent idea because it gives a background for the lessons and the context in which you're going to be embarking upon a change of mind, so monumental that I call it the Olympics of the mind. When you are completely and absolutely dedicated to living this way, you are given the opportunity to know how to practice it and also how to live it. And I find that in 44 years, I don't know that I can do more than I have and that I'm trying to do. My particular path right now at my age is to see everyone through the eyes of Christ, to absolutely accomplish forgiveness in every sickness, in every thought of ill health, in every situation where I am not seeing with the eyes that are my eyes of vision rather than my body eyes. So do I feel <laughs> that this is a way to enlightenment? I don't really know what enlightenment is. All I want to do is live in the happy dream. And the Course promises us, if we remove the barriers to letting go of fear, if we remove those barriers and they give us very specific steps, then God himself will take the final step. How long can you live in a happy dream? I don't have the slightest idea, but I have seen signs of it. Bill Thetford, as I have said many times, at his death, for weeks before he died, 
was such a different person that he was shining. You could actually see rays coming from him if you closed your eyes. You absolutely knew that this man had accomplished what he set out to do. He asked for a better way and he found it. Not only did he find the better way, he practiced it, he used it, and he accomplished it. So if that's called enlightenment, that's good enough for me. I call it the happy dream. Great, thank you. Another question. Can you tell us if you, Ken, Helen, and Bill have had a mystical experience of oneness? Thank you. I would like a little more edification on that question. Did we have an experience of oneness together or did we have it individually in what we would call a transpersonal or a metaphysical experience? That's a really good question. And I'll have to wait and see if we get more details in the chat window. But why don't you choose how you would like to answer that? I'll do that. And please forgive me if it's not the answer that you're looking for. <laughs> Uh, Helen definitely had more metaphysical experiences than I could count, and Bill told me he took down about 80 of them, meaning he was writing it up, as she told him, for a few years before the course even came. Uh, when the course started to come and announce itself by, this is a course in miracles, please take notes, then, of course, it was all attention was spent for her to listen and take them down in shorthand, bring them to Bill the next morning and he would type them up and they would read it and marvel at what it was saying or be resistant in Helen's case. But she did have many metaphysical experiences where she felt that she was also in tune with something much greater than herself where her body disappeared and she felt only the love of God. Bill certainly had experiences. Again, I think if you were to read a book about Bill, uh, Carol Howe actually wrote one that's quite excellent. Don't forget to laugh, never forget to laugh. Then I think you would find some of those experiences in there. And as for myself, well, I wouldn't be here talking with you if my life didn't start at a very young age with spontaneous mystical experiences that let me know that this was not my home. Now, what does that mean? Well, in ET, we know what it means. Everybody cries when ET wants to go home. We all want to go home. I fell out a window when I was three years old, right in front of my parents' eyes. And as they ran to grab me, uh, and I was actually what I felt like suspended as I was falling in slow motion. I, at three years old, was crying, I want to go home, I want to go home. And they took me to the doctor and they ascertained there was nothing really the matter with me. And the doctor said to me, stop crying, why are you crying? And I said, I want to go home. And when they drove me home and stopped in front of our house, they said very soothingly, they are there, dear, you're home. And I remember screaming, this is not my home. I want to go home. What I meant was, I want to go where I'm safe and don't fall out of windows. So there was another home, even at three years old, that I intuited or remembered. And I think everyone does. I'm not unique in this at all. But all through my life, I've had spontaneous experiences, except one when my teeth were pulled. That was a pretty powerful one, too, where... And we could go on forever because <laughs> they still fascinate me. But I see them as learning tools that I was given so that I could keep on going and I would know you are absolutely right in your experience of something more than this world. And that was indeed what led me to the course itself. Thank you, Judy. Another question is, do you still have contact with Helen, Bill, or Ken, or a sense of their presence, even though they have passed? Um, I did not long after they died, but I haven't recently. No, but they're always in my heart. So it's not discreet. It's, I just feel that which is their presence is not limited, of course, anymore to a physical body but is much more diffused and I can call upon it whenever I want, that presence. 
and it would be a combination of, I do talk to them, certainly in my mind, sometimes aloud, uh, situation specific. And um, when my husband died a year and a half ago, he had promised me he would never leave me and he never lied. And he hasn't. That's again, another subject. But it is so powerful a feeling that I feel I couldn't be here today talking with you if I didn't have him living in me available energetically. And I think that's what we have to think about when we think of in contact. They are not their bodies anymore. They're much more than that. And they can be there and be inspiring and they can show us the way, just the way the Holy Spirit can, Jesus can. It's really all one, isn't it? Thank you. Another question is, I understand forgiveness is the key to entering the kingdom of God. My challenge has been special relationships. I would like to experience being a mother here in the dream. Is this something that sounds like I need to overcome? Why would you want to overcome, overcome a desire for a wonderful experience like that? I think again, we, we place too much too much importance upon the world and what we think we should or want to have in the world, rather than ask, what is this for? How can I help? How can I love? If you're to be loved as a mother is loved and loves, by all means, why not have a baby or two or three or four? It really is all the same. But asking and getting to the habit of asking is much more important to me than whether you should or should not have the idea of wanting to be a mother. And as people could say, the world is in such terrible shape. Why should I bring a child into this world? Why not, if not for love? Beautiful. Can you talk some, Judy, about healing? We have someone who's asked specifically about that. They have a husband who has been very ill. Talk about healing? Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, first of all, healing is always of the mind. Now, we see bodies ill, no question about that. And we grieve when bodies are very ill especially if we can't help them. But if you think about being with a parent, a friend, a mate who is very ill, you know they're going to be getting the best medical care that you could help them get. But what do they really need except your heart and your mind at one with them? What do they really need except someone who loves them so much that he or she can help them release fear that they have of the situation. It is not up to us to decide how to heal. That's what the Course calls an unhealed healer. It is only to say, I am willing, use me, and take direction. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do, because he who sent me will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Healing is a very long subject. We are going to have discussions about that. I'm not so sure it's pertinent right now because we're talking about Helen and Bill, and I would love to have questions about that. But I promise you in, in webinars to come as we discuss ACIM, healing will be a major part of that. Okay, Judy. We have another question. Um, and I just want to respect people's questions. Maybe it's not about um, what you learn from the scribes, but let's have a go at it. Where do you see uh, ACIM.org 10 years from now? <laughs> Does the foundation intend to work more closely with other ACIM organizations? <laughs> this reminds me of a man of a large organization once came to visit us 
and he also publishes a book that is quite well known in the spiritual realm. And he said, I see A Course in Miracles wherever I look, and we've been around much longer than you. And I said, and he said, well, we want to learn how to publicize our document. And I said, well, what can we tell you? He said, can you tell me your publication plan? And I said, when the books are needed, we publish them. Well, can you tell me your distribution plan? I said, we have no plan. <laughs> People who need it go to bookstores or they write us. He said, what about a business plan? Can you give me your business plan? My board of directors would love to have a business plan if you'd be generous enough to, to share it with us. And I said, sure. He said, oh, great. Will you go and get it? I said, I can't get it. We don't have any. He said, what, what do you, how can you run an organization and not have a business plan? And I said, when we were first given this material in trust, I asked the same questions you did. I wanted a five-year plan for the Foundation for Inner Peace. And the voice through Helen said kindly, you do not need a five-year plan. Don't you know that I will be with you every second along the way? I will tell you what to do when it's needed, and you will follow it, and we will be glad together. I will tell you what you need at any given time, and I will provide everything that you need. How in the world can I say where the foundation for the peace is going to be 10 years from now? I didn't even think we'd be here today. So we have no idea, and it's just not given us to think that way. And we're very comfortable just asking the Holy Spirit for everything, even in a daily meeting, whether it's an altercation between two people who are working together who at that moment are having friction, or whether it's funding, or whether it's do we publish large size type, or do we just name, just name the idea. We don't know, we ask. And when we get a sense that something else is needed or desired of us, then we ask what that is and we're told how. A case in point is today's webinar. A few months ago, we didn't even think of having webinars. And then it came in some very interesting context, three or four times through different people, that this is the time to do this. And then we all asked together, and we absolutely heard yes. I had a feeling that the answer was thought you'd never ask, <laughs> but I'm not saying it was. That's the way we operate. We can't operate any other way because we do not know what anything is for. And the rules of the world in time and how one acts and how one performs and how one runs an organization and one's own life it's all the same thing that comes back to asking, 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 asking. That's what the Course teaches. That's what we follow. Thank you. We have another question from Sonia. When Helen was dying, there were more messages from Jesus. Is that correct? The gifts of God. Can you tell us about that time and these writings? Well, that isn't quite accurate. Uh, the gifts of God did not come when Helen was dying, not at all. And if I remember the date, it was probably 1977 with the gifts of God. And uh, the poetry was published after she died, the gifts of God, which was 1982, when I got an inner message to publish Helen's poetry, although she would never show it to anyone while she was alive. And my daughter and I were very cognizant that it was my grandmother's, who was very close to the two of us, the anniversary of her death. So we decided to go to a medium. And we thought that would be a lark. And we were sitting there, and this woman, who didn't know us at all, said that there was someone whose first name began with H. And she had something to say to me. Well, there was only one big H in my life. I knew other Helens, but she was the main Helen. And we asked, you know, what was it? She said, the idea that you have about publishing my book, it's okay to do it now. So even that, 
I hadn't even had a chance to ask yet, should we publish Helen's poetry? The idea had just occurred to me. And in this wonderful little interplay uh, in the strange woman's home, um, I got some more confirmation about it. I want to correct what I said because I was thinking of Song of Prayer when I heard the question, and we are talking about gifts of God. Gifts of God poetry started coming to Helen about the beginning of the course and some, a couple of them even before. And so that when they came through a period of um, 12 years and there were a couple of final poems, but they weren't when Helen was dying. Because when Helen was dying, believe me, she was busy dying. Okay, here's another question from Lynn Corona. Do you have a painting of Jesus that you particular resonate with? Did Helen or Bill? The answer is no. <laughs> okay. Not a particular painting. Helen was always embarrassed by Jesus. I mean, you have to remember Helen was Jewish. She wasn't raised Jewish, but culturally she was Jewish because other people told her she was. Mm -hmm. Her name was Helen Cohen. So she wouldn't have had a picture of Jesus hanging in her house. Now, how did she feel about Jesus? That's a totally different story. It was a very intimate relationship with her. Um, Ken used to say when she was upset, let's go hear what Jesus has to say. And sometimes she would rebuff him and sometimes she wouldn't, but always she listened. She had tremendous love, respect and devotion and well, we know she did her job. Wonderful. Uh, following up on that, is it accurate that Helen didn't consider the process of quote, hearing the voice and bringing forth the course as channeling? Helen didn't like any of those so-called psychic words. Remember, she was a professor of psychology at the School of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia University. You don't get much higher in the academic world than that. And there was no way that she wanted anybody to know about anything that she did, as she said, was funny stuff. And so anything psychic, she would not be connected with in public. Did she have an interest in those things? Oh, yes, she did. And Helen and Bill, before I met them, had visited some of the great psychics of the world. Bill mostly took Helen around because he wanted her not to be so fearful. He wanted her to see that ordinary, nice people like themselves didn't fuss and fret over these amazing gifts that were given them. And I think it was helpful, probably. Does that answer that question or did I get on a tangent? <laughs> I think that was beautiful. Okay. Another question, how do we sustain or renew miracle readiness? Oh my goodness, I have an answer that said over and over again, I have the same answer to all the questions. How do we sustain it? We ask how. We're different people. We're separated from ourself in ego form and in body. We don't know the first thing of how to do these things. That's why we have an internal guide. That's why we have an inner teacher. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the voice for God. We don't know anything. And all you have to do is ask, if anything comes out of our time together today, I hope it will be that, that your familiarity and practice of constantly asking, even the smallest things, I'm not talking about asking for your refrigerator to be full of some exotic food or asking for a suit of many colors or asking for the way home from a party at late at night, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but I'm talking about recognizing why you're asking because you want the guidance of that which knows and not your ego. Thank you, Judy. One more question I think we'll do for now, and then we'll close with a silent meditation to encapsulate all of this. Um, we have a question of, do you have any favorite puns of Bill's that you particularly love? 
well, I gave you one of them, heaven is your real estate. <laughs> I probably 10 or 15 years ago, I would remember more of them right now. Let's see. Mm. I can't think of offhand, of course, as soon as we say goodbye, I'll think of many. But again, you can find them in Carol Howe's book. And I would also want to recommend, because I think it's so excellent, Ken Wapnick's book, Absence from Felicity, that really is a much more complete story of Helen and his relationship with her. And I would say in her whole life, he was probably the closest person to her, aside from Bill. Great, thank you. Let me just take a moment to pause and see if there are any other questions. And I'm asking specifically the moderators. Well then, I think that we will, as we have in previous webinars, end with a closing silence. And I actually have a bell that I can ring at the end. Judy, do you have any closing words that you'd like to share? I want to thank all of you for coming to visit me in my garden. And know that you indeed are as everyone else in the circle of love. That all you have to do to remember that at the most difficult time in your life is to just close your eyes and ask for help. I wish all of you the ease and the fluidity of being able to do that every second of your life. Thank you, Judy. With that, we'll go into silence and I will ring the bell. Thank you all for joining us.